Robin Hood Radio presents Stage Right or Not with Michelle Willems. Michelle is a longtime journalist and herself is a published playwright of several theatrical works. She's a frequent contributor to the Huffington Post, Daily Beast, and the Atlantic websites. Well, my theater going week in New York included a challenging piece from an interesting and new to me company, one that takes on difficult subjects and demands viewers to look inside their own psyches. The results are not necessarily feel-good works, but that is not to be confused with worthy ones. More on that in a minute. Now, I also saw the latest offering from the always illuminating Mint Theater, one of my favorite companies that digs up old and forgotten plays, mostly from other countries. And such is the case with The Price of Thomas Scott by one Elizabeth Baker, a British writer who had a rather unusual career and life in and, in and around the 1920s. Now, one thing about Mint shows is that the real-life stories of the playwrights are sometimes more interesting than the plays themselves. And that is certainly true with The Price of Thomas Scott, now playing at the company's Theater Row venue. The Mint's artistic director, Jonathan Bank, directed the production rather listlessly, I regret to say, which runs 90 minutes, almost feels like the first act of what could be a longer show. Now, many of the Mint productions are much longer because in the past, playwrights had the luxury of creating multiple characters and giving them layered arcs. This play does have 11 roles, but mostly are given short shrift, and the plot here is surprisingly simple. It deals with a family involved with a millinery business but struggling financially that is led by a highly religious father who believes things like theater and particularly dancing are immoral. This comes into focus when a generous and timely offer to buy the family home emerges, one that would allow the members of the clan to follow their dreams elsewhere. But then it is revealed that the potential buyer runs dance halls. You're a hard man, Thomas Scott, says another character, when Mr. Scott claims he cannot stand by to, quote, watch these walls of memory turn into halls of pleasure. There are other nice lines here. A man shouldn't let his conscience make a fool of him. Give me another chance to make you love me. It will be a novelty to have breakfast with a man who won't sell his soul. But overall, the dialogue does not sparkle as you so wish it would. When the cast breaks into dance at the curtain call, you almost sigh with relief that the sense of dullness has been momentarily lifted. The play is clearly influenced by the life of writer Elizabeth Baker. She, too, was raised in a rather pious home. Born in 1876, she had worked from a young age in her father's or family's drapery business. Then she became a clerk and typist and began writing plays in 1909. Her most celebrated was called Chains, ahead of its time, apparently. It tapped into workers, especially women, who were eager to get out of unsatisfying jobs and marriages. One critic called Chains the most brilliant and the deepest problem played by a modern British writer since Major Barbara. Well, the good news is that The Mint is going to present that play, as well as a few others in a coming season devoted to playwright Baker. Let's hope the least interesting ones started things off and better ones are on their way. Now, the price of Thomas Scott may have too little to ponder, but at the Here Center, much further downtown, there is almost too much to chew on. A piece with a long title of Rocco, Chelsea, Adriana, Sean, Claudia, Gianni, and Alex is a co-production of the Taya Creative Company and the Private Theater. And this show is only up a few weeks, and it's a challenging and provocative and finally moving work. It is immersive in that the audience surrounds the actors and is constantly asked to move to follow various characters. The issues covered are pretty standard, on paper anyway, the gay black son with HIV, immigration, the repercussions of 9-11, the adopted child eventually needing to meet the mother who gave her up, but the actors are pretty riveting and difficult roles, and in the end, the theme is conflict resolution, a timely and necessary one. Taya Creative is about what it calls inside art, focused not on plot so much, but on what makes humans tick on the inside. And ultimately, the audience members also are left wondering how they would respond or act in similar situations. 
The show, created by Viev Arata Price and John Gould Rubin, is done with such good intentions that one has to hope for a future and longer run. I think with some fine-tuning, maybe reducing a character or two and eliminating some of the stagecraft, opening and closing tables with way too much time and no- noise, this could be a piece that stands the test of time. Now, as for other theater news of the week, we have yet another dispute. No, not over Michael Jackson. I'll give you a week off on that one. But over to Kill a Mockingbird. It seems that before Aaron Sorkin reimagined the Harper Lee book for mega producer Scott Rudin, multiple productions of a smaller theatrical version of the book had been playing around the country for years. And quite a few were set to go again. Suddenly, Rudin legally forced all regional companies close to urban centers in particular, to cease and desist their mockingbirds. So a lot of productions were halted mid-rehearsal, causing financial losses and confusing schedule changes. The companies wanted to fight back, but obviously they don't have the kinds of resources available to take on Scott Rudin and Aaron Sorkin in court. Then the reaction to the strong arming was so strong that Rudin turned around and offered not to allow the smaller and older versions to go on, per se, but for the new sore conversion to be performed at those theaters. Well, a few may do so, but most were too far into the others or had already switched to different plays. It's a rather weird story, yet another chapter in the Broadway production's long and legally complicated road to great success. Harper Lee likely had no real understanding what the big Broadway bucks were about. And I don't know, something here does not feel entirely fair, which makes me wonder, Jill, what would Atticus Finch have said? Oh, I am so glad you brought that up. (laughs) Because I was trying to figure out a way to say, all right, so yes, now look at this. All right. If there's a polite way to talk about this, because it seems so um, inefficient. It's it's Mm -hmm. like saying, now, I understand the um, money and rights version. I totally totally get that. From a a business standpoint, I sort of understand it. But from a theatrical um, Mm -hmm. standpoint, just in terms of the various interpretations, how many things have we seen that have been deconstructed uh, sometimes to the benefit and sometimes to the detriment. Um, If, if you can't do your version of something, right? How, how can you, I mean, how can you in this format for Latin again, business excluded, how can you say this is the only version that can yeah. be done from now on is going to be the the ticket to mockingbird on stage you know most people probably aren't aware that there has been a little production to kill mockingbird going around the country for years including in the town where harper lee is from monroeville or whatever it's called um they do it every year and so i think that probably confused people oh there's been another one and why should this new version of impact that well they obviously got the harper lee family rights whatever that means but listen scott rudin turned that around pretty quickly it's the apologies not only probably not enough but it's too late but he misunderstood then he said god i would never want to hurt any the, the you know this is theater going and most people are never going to get to broadway let's face it to see <laughs> aaron sorkin's version right right and and by the, by the way I, I the apology it's it's so interesting has not yet burbled uh into uh the the uh the what the provinces that's it right so well, just 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 yeah. just just by just by the way, the information did, but as is so often uh, the case with corrections and retractions, when somebody right. says, you know, that was not the intended result. Sorry, you know, well, you have to right. really scrutinize the fine print about a week and a half later to discover that. Yeah, and I don't know. It's very hard to understand why they would think that the little productions going on in little towns all around the country, which are the original, based on the original book, you know, what, why that would be impacted by the other, or... Who licenses, a, are, is there a license for the that version? Small ones, I'm sure there are, it, yes, whoever the writer is on that, or there, there is a company behind those, so 
but you know they wouldn't have the power to. Oh no, of course not. I've just uh, you, you know this is this yes, is like the, is, the mega a, the megalopolis yeah. comes to town and says you know sorry we're yeah. shutting you down and. That's right. Or if you want to do it, you do our version. Well, you know, all these other versions have kids playing the roles of kids. The Broadway version doesn't. So what are they supposed to do? Fire the little kids and bring in their parents to come and play? You know, it's it's preposterous. That's not going to happen. You know, they tried to turn it around quickly. It's just a, it's it's been a winding, a long and winding road, as we know, to get Mockingbird on, to kill a Mockingbird on Broadway. It's a huge success. Great. But why it would affect, I don't know. I was trying but to that, think if there's ever been another example like this. I, but I can't, but I'm sorry to just, just, just stutter, but yeah. if you take a Broadway show and you put it on the road, you right. don't have the same uh, bells and whistles because it's really hard in many cases to pack those up and right. put them, you know, and put them in the bus. Yeah. So and, how, and how... Unless the, I, I, I just I, I don't even see it. What, 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 what? I know it's a very hard one to understand because it just it's. Well, I don't know what and, how one impacts the other so and much. And given my, fair enough, you know. Given my uh, just sort of inborn prejudice, I am yeah. perfectly happy to say that it's someone who didn't understand. <laughs> you know, it was yeah. someone who took. I'm not even including. <clears throat> Mr. Rudin in this. I'm just saying that yeah. in execution, it was someone who doesn't understand uh, my favorite word term, context. It's like, oh, right, yeah. well, you've got to, you can't do this. And it's, right. I, I have a similar problem when people run around saying, you know, there won't be any cash in 20 years. No, Guess no. what? Yeah, these are called the optics. You know, you'd think somebody at Scott Rudin's company might say, hey, you know, this is going to look really bad, you know. That we're crushing all these little theaters around the country. But I don't uh, even. Th I don't think it. Was, I. I have to say, and in fairness, I mean, I'm sure I'll be. I'm not sure I could well be proven wrong for this. But I think it wasn't even about the optics. I don't know that that was fully the intention of squishing every single version yeah. of Mockingbird out of creation when it was shall we say, dropped into the public domain as far as information. That's, I think it was someone who didn't understand how this stuff works and therefore what the consequences were going to be. At okay. least that's my, that's my I'm, I'm feeling generous today. Usually everybody knows that I'm a mean old person. But um, crank, yeah. well, you know, but right now I'm going to go with, hey, someone just really uh, lost the plot there. Yeah, this one got screwed up somewhere along the way. You wonder, didn't they know? Didn't Shorkin and uh, know that all these little companies were doing, continuing to do, you know, why? Can't it think out, that they didn't. Not while they are mid-rehearsal, you know. Can't think that they didn't. That's why I think that it's a mis uh, a misinterpretation and a misapplication is, is where what I'm going with right now, but we'll see. So, because it's uh, just, it's too, if, if, if you are in the business, I mean, again, you you do know that the show that you see on Broadway is not the show that you see in most cases on the tour. Right. Or if you do, it's not going to be for two years down the line because, let's face it, this one's going to be on Broadway a long time. So, uh, I don't know, the whole thing got got weird. And um, <laughs> like I said, we we need a good, a good Atticus Finch at this time, who is a, not so much about theater but about integrity and... Why can't the two be combined, right? They, 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 they can, and you watch. I, well, my, my, yeah. my hope, my devout wish, is that this gets sorted out, and it will be Jillicus Finch and Michellicus Finch. There you go. Hope for the best. All right, I hope you have a great week. Stage Right or Not with Michelle Willens, produced in the studios of Robin Hood Radio, robinhoodradio.com.